I'm absolutely delighted to be back again. I'm, I'm afraid I'm getting to be a bad habit for you people, though. <laughs> and I'm going to run out, but if you tolerate me, I'm glad of it. This year I grew uh, an extra leg. I uh, fell on the stairway and damaged the stairway quite badly, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> that wasn't anything compared to what happened in my garden. I have raised beds so that I can keep the soil concentrated and mixed. And I was working in my garden, putting in, and I tripped over the board. There it went. And I tripped over the board and, and laid there for a while, wondering if I was ever going to get up again. <laughs> and now, um, in two weeks, the doctor is going to fix up the damage. So. I'm thankful for that, but I'm hobbling a little bit, and I pre appreciate your tolerance for that. Um, <clears throat> I want to mention one other personal matter. Um, our family had a very difficult winter this year. My, my wife had breast cancer, um, which was discovered small and early, and so she was able to she was, Christ Jesus led her out of it. So we're very thankful for that. Then my son had malignant melanoma right afterwards, and that was even more devastating. And so then we, um, and he's okay. And then my 97-year-old mother-in-law, whose father come, immigrated from down in Fleckefjord, um she got double pneumonia, so we were really afraid we were going to lose her. But she has good, strong Norwegian blood, and she scared the illness away. So, so we're, we're doing fine in spite of everything and grateful for it. So um, we're going to move through the Book of Concord tonight and um, take a look at um, what happens to Luther in the Book of Concord? This is a lot of fun. Um, basically, as I understand it, my task is to introduce these confessions. Some of you know them, lot, or lots of you, they're unfamiliar. I've spent a lifetime teaching them and still learn from them, so I'm glad to introduce such old friends. Luther's quest was personal when it began. He himself went through some very difficult experiences, not unfamiliar, you yourselves, or maybe someone in your family has been touched by death early, hmm? <coughs> and learned the threat that death poses. Uh, Luther was hunting with a friend and wearing the knife that German students traditionally war and he fell as I fell in my garden and drove the dagger into his leg, hit an artery, and so his friend left him propped upside down against the tree holding the pressure point <laughs> while he ran for help. That's a good position in which to think about your future. Huh? Um, and then uh, Luther had another experience with death close to that, which uh, was also quite difficult. And he began to think about God in a different way. Not speculatively or philosophically or even theologically. He began to think about God and what God thinks of me. Huh? That's a question that death can raise. And so, as he began to think about that, he was driven to, to Scripture with this question, how do I find, find a gracious God? The answer to that question that appeared to him out of Romans, was given to him from the book of Romans, drove the whole Reformation. It happened that when he became a monk, he was given the same question. It wasn't merely personal, 
It became more public. When he became a monk, he was assigned this question as part of his first year, the novitiate in the monastery. And the question was to familiarize him with the means of grace in the sacraments of the church. So he studied the question academically as well. Um, and, and it became not only personal, but more public. But when he published the 95 Theses, it really became public. <laughs> the Theses spread all over Europe as though they had hit a fan. I had a student once who drove a tractor with the um, power takeoff moving into a manure pile. <laughs> he took him several baths to get over that. Huh? Um, the, uh, Luther did something similar. He, he drove that question and raised the question and it spread all over Europe. So he had something to do with it, but the bureaucrats in Rome had even more to do with it. Um, they immediately turned Luther's question into a challenge to the papacy. And of course they were eager to punish. From the beginning, the attempt to deal with Luther's question was completely negative. They wanted more than anything to put him out of business, to stop the question altogether. Uh, but it had gotten so widespread and so public that they couldn't stop it. And Luther had so much support um, that they couldn't really shut him down. And so um, eventually, when force failed, they tried to talk with him. <laughs> and those conversations are what we, what produced the Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord. So we'll take a quick look at these seven documents so that you can renew your familiarity with them. Well, you, you know many of them, and they're like meeting old friends huh? as you come to know them even better. Um, four, uh, three of these documents were written for uh, negotiations with other parties in the Reformation. And so um, let me turn it around and begin again. Three of these documents were written to consolidate what was happening in the Reformation. The first of these you know very well, that's Luther's small catechism. In 1526-27, uh, the elector of Saxony wanted to do a survey of the state of the church in his area. Um, what he discovered was quite shocking for him. Um, <coughs> once, several years ago, we were in Africa traveling and we came across a village where everybody was drunk. Everybody in town. That was a fairly common event in 16th century Germany. They found, and where you find drunkenness, of course, you find people who can't find the right bed when they're on the way home. And so you find other difficulties and lots of religious ignorance. There were people that refused to learn the Lord's Prayer because it was too long, huh? too much to expect. And there were people who had not a clue about the Christian faith. And so the question was how to deal with this. Luther wrote, the small catechism for this purpose. He collected together the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and with these three parts, which he called the catechism, he also offered explanations of the um, of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And later there was added a statement concerning the keys, the office of confession. So many of you know this. Um, I always love to tell, I learned it from my grandpa. 
<laughs> who was concerned that my father would not teach me the catechism. So my grandpa um, taught me the catechism at the same time he taught me to drive a tractor. <laughs> we, we had an old John Deere, which in the States were called one lung Johnnies because they had one cylinder and they had a real distinctive rhythm. If you've ever heard a John Deere tractor, you never forget it. And so my grandpa would keep me between his knees and I would be steering while he was making sure nothing went wrong. And he would say to me, what is the first and chief commandment of the law? <laughs> what is the first article of the creed? What does it mean when we say, Our Father who art in heaven? Even still, when I recite those meanings, you can hear the rhythm of that tractor. <laughs> I learned it like a dance. Huh? Well, there's better places to learn, I suppose, but I couldn't think of a better one to learn the catechism. Huh? I mean, and many of you learned it from people that you dearly love and who have been shaping to you. Some of them were grandparents and some of them were pastors. Some of them were neighbors. Huh? That's what the catechism is for. If you've got a small catechism, you know that there's got to be a large one someplace. Hmm? And so there is, when he wrote the small catechism for the families to use in instruction of their children, Luther used, also wrote a large catechism to instruct the pastors. This is indeed a bigger volume. Huh? Uh, still, Luther is relaxed and fun. This is an enjoyable document to study. Once I was out in California teaching the large catechism and there was a rich man in the congregation who bought one for everybody in the church and wrote me a letter and said, we reformed the whole congregation. <laughs> so you can get a lot out of it. It's well worth studying and it's pretty accessible. Luther takes a poke at the Pope every once in a while just for fun, but it's pretty peaceful too. So those are the two first, and then there's one more um, that was written particularly for Lutherans, and that's the, the latest document in the Book of Concord that's called the Formula of Concord. Now, this document has a very complex history. The Lutherans um, fell to fighting among themselves. It's as though they couldn't get enough action with Roman Catholics and Calvinists. And so they turned on one another in what Philip Melanchthon described as the rabies of the theologians. <laughs> it was awful. One of the classic statements is called, against the ridiculous opinions vomited up by Paul Krell. <laughs> so, so you get an idea. They were not very polite. And when the, when, uh, <laughs> the Prussians took over, they fired them all. I mean, they weren't going to put up with these guys. But it, uh, so, uh, uh, the whole Lutheran community was divided into two. One group was called the Philippists. They were named after Philip Melanchthon and styled themselves as his true students. And the other, the wild men, huh, were the Gnasio Lutherans. Um, they styled themselves as the true students of Luther, and they were, they were led for a long time by one of the great people in the history of Lutheranism. He was a Croat, and his name was Matthias Flaccius Illyricus, F-A-L-C-I-U-S, sometimes spelled with two C's, Flaccius, um, Missouri Synod's people say Flacius, so I always say Flacius, just so that I'm not in full altar and pulpit fellowship. <laughs> Flacius, he is, uh, he was as wonderful as his uh, name. He, he was condemned for arguing 
that after the fall, our nature is original sin itself. And that a human being is converted even though he rages and roars against it. <laughs> I have converted some people like that and they're always the most fun. Huh? <laughs> I baptized one this, this fall, huh? or I mean this spring. He was full of contempt, drinking heavily, and we, the president of it, the AA and I finally caught up with him. And we brought him to church to be baptized. And the president of AA was gone, I thought. And he came walking in during the baptismal service and said to me, well, I just thought I should be here. <laughs> so sometimes raging and roaring is a good thing. But Flacius's argument was not necessarily welcomed and he was condemned as a heretic. <clears throat> so we have these three documents. Now, we have four documents that were written for, for negotiations with other parties in the Reformation. Uh, most of these documents, all except one, were written by Philip Melanchthon. Um, Melanchthon is a very interesting theologian and person. When people look at Luther's handwriting and compare it with Melanchthon's, they almost always mistake Luther's handwriting is very small and precise. He had a neat hand. Melanchthon's handwriting is big and sprawling. Huh? He could have used a penmanship teacher. Hmm? So, but it's, he's a very fine writer and it's fun to read. It's directly accessible. He is the author, uh, so to speak, of the first of these documents, that's the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession has lots of nicknames among Lutherans. The most important one is from the town in Germany where it was uh, presented. It's called the Augustana. Hmm? It was presented to the emperor at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. Um, this was, a, I could spend the whole time telling stories about this. It's a lot of fun. Um, the most fun is when they wrote the document, um, they were going to present it orally. And the elector, Charles V, who was um, trying to stop the Lutherans, was worried that if they presented it publicly, it would start a riot. So he arranged for this to be presented in a small ecclesiastical palace it's called <laughs> the bishop's residence but it was very hot that june in in southern germany so the lutherans realized that the windows would have to be opened and so they got a man to read it out loud who was known to be very loud his name was Christian Heyer. I had some of his descendants in one of my parishes and I hated to have them on the church council <laughs> because they were as noisy as their forebear. Huh? <laughs> so Christian Heyer stood, uh, stood up to read the Augsburg Confession to the emperor and he, the whole thousands of people gathered around this palace heard him but the emperor fell sound asleep. <laughs> he had an unusual characteristic. He had a very large tongue. And when he slept, his tongue would hang out like a dog's. <laughs> so, so he was sitting, <laughs> listening to the Augsburg Confession with his tongue <laughs> drooling to the side. So the Augsburg Confession was immediately recognized as a great document. Melanchthon put his heart and soul into it, and he, uh, it's very gentle, peaceable, 
and wherever possible seeks to find words that will be accepted to the whole church. So when he got done reading it, the Catholic Bishop of Augsburg stood up and said, this is nothing but the Catholic truth, which disappointed the emperor. He was awakened by that noise. <laughs> so you get a sense of it. This is a favorite document of Lutherans. If you haven't read it, you'll enjoy it very much. Then um, the Catholic authorities, of course, were worried sick about what would happen if this got loose, and so they declared it to have been, they refused to let anybody read it, first of all. Um, they kept all the copies, or tried to, and then they, they refused to allow anybody to read it. So, and then they announced that it had been refuted. This disappointed Philip Melanchthon a lot. And so he, he wrote a second document that's called The Apology to the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession is fun to read. The Apology is hard to read. My students always complained when I assigned the Apology to them. I told them I would give them coffee so that they could keep up. And if they came to class late in the afternoon, I would give them sandwiches so that they would stay awake. <laughs> This, this is not, you know, uh, the kind of reading that is going to make you very excited, but it's very closely argued theological reasoning and quite helpful. Now, um, we've got the Augsburg Confession and we've got the apology to the Augsburg Confession. And so now we have six of the seven documents and we have one more to talk about, and that is called the Small Called Articles. The Small Called Articles. Luther, after 1531, was more symbol than reality as a leader. He was sickly all through his life from 1531 until, well, really late, 1528, all the way to his death in 1546. The problem was his heart. He had a terrible heart attack. Um, dear Lord Katie, his beloved wife, was a very skillful doctor. She learned her practice while she was a nun and collected all the medical lore and she had soups and she had medicinal beer and she had lots of wine and she had everything else she needed to thought, but uh, still Luther continued to have a number of health difficulties. His heart was bad. He had tinnitus. If any of you have suffered from ringing in the ears, you know how painful this can be. He also suffered from vertigo, so he would get up into that high pulpit and he'd <laughs> start, start thinking about falling. <laughs> so, in 1531, he preached five times. I mean, he was, he was not healthy at all, and they didn't want him in the pulpit because uh, they were afraid of what would happen. Of course, he was teaching, and of course, you could do anything but keep Luther down. Katie just about despaired of it. She'd lock him in this room and he'd sneak out and go to work. <laughs> and when he would go to work, he would customarily work three or four days before collapsing and going to sleep. Uh, that was just his nature. Um, he had more energy than you can imagine. So, um, he, even though he was half of himself, he was still about twice as much as most of us. <laughs> and just going like a house fire. Um, he was a little tired of watching Melanchthon go off to these meetings. He, he would have liked to go to the meetings. <laughs> because he was afraid that Melanchthon would sell the farm. Hmm? That he would betray. Uh, Melanchthon was one of those irenic people that likes to win. 
So he would make concessions and make concessions, but he still wanted to have control at the end. Luther used to joke about this. He said, Melanchthon thinks he's God. <laughs> he always wants to write the end of the story. Well, he was a great theologian and he was very helpful, but Luther was getting eager. Huh? And in 1534-35, there started to show up some differences between Luther and Melanchthon. Melanchthon was rewriting some things, and there were a couple of issues where he was, he made Luther real nervous. One was in the doctrine of law. Luther was afraid that Melanchthon was making too many concessions to the law. And the other was in the doctrine of the sacrament. Hmm? Luther liked to emphasize the reality of Christ's presence as strongly as possible. So you remember these words, in, with, and under. Hmm? He is in with Christ, is in, with, and under the bread and the wine. In 1540, Melanchthon published a statement called the Altered Augsburg Confession. In English, we can say this in a nasty way. I call it the neutered Augsburg Confession. This is what you do to your cat, or if it wanders, or your dog, early in its life, huh? The neutered Augsburg Confession. It's so soft on the real presence that even Calvin thought it was great. <laughs> so, <laughs> Luther was, there was reason for his nervousness, and so, in 1536, he decided that he was going to write a confession. And this is the small cold articles. Of course, he was very sick at the time. Some of you have suffered from kidney stones. That is certainly one of the most painful afflictions that anybody can have. Huh? And so uh, Luther called it the stone and he talked about all the extraordinary measures they were taking to make him pass the stone. Some of them don't, some of them don't bear public repetition. It was, medicine was not necessarily so great in those days. And then um, they were going to, the theologians were going to meet in the city up in small cult, up in the mountains, and so the, the elector, Luther's prince, insisted that he should go. And so Luther was carried in a cart, horse-drawn cart, across mountain roads. <laughs> you don't need much of an imagination to figure that out. He was carried jostling and bumping and screaming all the way to the meeting, and when he got there, he was so exhausted that they just put him on the cart and sent him home again. <laughs> and he, um, but the trip saved his life. The stone passed. <laughs> I'll spare you Luther's description. <laughs> he measured the amount <laughs> that was involved. I used to put that on a test and ask the students how many Pints Luther passed when the stone went. <laughs> um, he, oops, he had written the document for the um, theologians to consider. Um, Melanchthon didn't want that document to be presented because it was Luther at his forthright best. <laughs> not really caring much what his enemies thought of it. And it was, it's a dangerously explosive document, huh? When you read it. Um, uh, so it was never officially passed. Melanchthon used um, parliamentary methods to make sure that it wasn't ever ratified. But it was circulated and it's still good reading for Lutheran pastors. This is a lot of fun. Luther starts to preach. I'm going to read you some statements from the small cult articles tomorrow, and you'll enjoy them as much as I do. He's, he's got a wonderful section here called Concerning the False Repentance of the Papists. 
<laughs> and it's the best statement on repentance you can find. Just beautiful. So, so this document was not officially ratified, but it's a habit. It's one of the documents of the Book of Concord. So these documents were all gathered together by the people who wrote the formula of Concord, and they were published in the Book of Concord. Now you should know one thing here in Bergen about this document. Um, at that time, um, though it has ended, the Danes ruled Norway. We have a hard time convincing Danish Americans that that ended. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they, th they think it continues even to this day. So we have to be properly insubordinate and tell them. But uh, at that time, the Danish king ruled Norway, and he had some advisors who were students of Melanchthon. They did not like this document. And so it never became official in Denmark and Norway. And even still, uh, Norwegian churches um, set, the small or set the formula of Concord at a secondary level. It's not as primary as the other documents. That's, I'm sorry about that. I think we're missing out on something. But you, you can read it sometime. You'll, it's not, you might not read it when you're sleepy. But it can be, it's a lot of fun. Anyway, the Book of Concord became the official definition of Lutheranism. So if you want to know what a Lutheran is, the first thing you read is the Bible. And when you have mastered scripture, if that ever should happen, then you read the Book of Concord. And what I'd say is you should read the small catechism. If you can get your grandpa to put you between your knees, it's better. Huh? But you can still learn a lot just sitting at the table. And so you start with the catechisms, and then you do the small cold articles and just have some fun. Okay? So there's a little introduction. I hope it wasn't too long. Anyway, we get a start. Thanks.